Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here with us this afternoon. Uh, my name is Philip Howes, and uh, on behalf of the over 3,000 writers and editors and translators, uh, I'd like to welcome, who, who are PIN members, I'd like to welcome all of you to the 8th Annual PIN World Voices Festival. Um, I want to take a, a, a quick moment to uh, thank the sponsors for the festival, who are um, the Hubs, which is the Standard Hotel, and also where we are right now, the Public Theater. Um, and in particular, there are some sponsors for this uh, talk, uh, which includes the Open Society Foundations and the Burma Project. Um, and I hope you all have had a chance. Today is the last day of the festival, so I hope you had a chance to visit some of these great events. Uh, but if not, there, I think there are a few left this evening, so please go and check them out. And if not, uh, go on the website and check out some of the video that's been captured um, and sign up for the PIN newsletter. Um, the, uh, the, the, the reason we're here today is to celebrate this fantastic anthology of Burmese poetry called Bones Will Crow. There are a few copies of the book that will be available after the reading today for purchase, and the authors will be there to, uh, to sign copies for you as well and to answer any lingering questions that we don't get to today. Uh, I'm really, really honored uh, to be sitting here with these brilliant uh, literary giants, basically, icons uh, of poetry. Uh, who traveled all the way here from Southeast Asia. Um, before we start, I just want to ask everyone if you could just turn your phones off or on silent if you have them, uh, or your beepers or pagers or anything like that, if you're like me from the 90s. Um, and uh, I want to just I'll also just remind you of the exits, which are, this is a theater, so we always want to make sure we know where the fire <laughs> exits are um, in case of something might happen, which of course nothing will happen, but just so you know. Uh, and I want to introduce to you these um, brilliant speakers who've, who've come such a far way to, um, to visit with us here today. So right here on my immediate left is Kose Arlin. Kose Arlin is a poet, critic, and writer, uh, and translator, and language instructor. He lives in Rangoon. Uh, he's instigated a wider appreciation of postmodern and language poetry forms into Burmese, and he's widely regarded as one of the most influential living poets in Burma. Besides his own collections, which include Distinguishing Features, published in 2006, Real Life Prose, Poems, published in 2009, Kilimanjaro in 2010, and Poetry Means Craft. He's also translated various Western poets, such as Sylvia Plath and Donald Justice, John Ashbery, and Charles Bernstein, and he's published a number of volumes uh, on poetics in Burma. In modern Burmese poetry, Zaya Lin has almost single-handedly propagated poetry from the head, or I think also called cerebral poetry, uh, as opposed to that from the heart. Um, and he's also published a lot of language-oriented Burmese poetry in the magazine Jacket uh, Number no. 2. Zaya Lin's influence is widely felt in the writings of the new generation of Burmese poets today. Um, I'm going to introduce the other two, and maybe then we'll give them all a round of applause. Immediately to Ko Zaya Lin's left, is uh, James Byrne. James, I said it right, right? Yeah. <laughs> James' uh, second poetry collection is called Blood Sugar. It was published by Art Publications in 2009. He edits the uh, international poetry magazine called The Wolf, which has published various Burmese poets, such as Zayar Lin, to my left, uh, so Burmese poet Saul Wei, and Zhao Ji. Uh, in 2008, James won a uh, Poetry Festival Prize in Serbia, which I don't know how to pronounce. How do I pronounce that? Don't, don't worry. Okay, great. <laughs> Several prizes. Uh, his selected poems, uh, his book, The Selected Poems, Vanishing House, was published uh, in Belgrade. He's the co-editor of Voice Recognition, which is, uh, which is a collection of 21 poets for the 21st century, an anthology of poets under the age of 35. Uh, and he recently edited uh, The Wolf, a decade of poems from 2002 to 2012. James was born uh, and currently lives in Cambridge, where he's a poet in residence at Clare Hall and a research associate at SOAS, the School of Oriental and African Studies. He completed his graduate studies just across the street at uh, New York University, where he received a Stein Fellowship. Um, to James's left, we have Kokin Al A. Uh, who was born and raised in Rangoon, uh, where he attended university. He's published 11 collections of poetry, 
which include collaborations with leading Burmese poets and translators such as Kose Arlin and his own cousin and early teacher, Ma Rousseau. Yes, Ma Rousseau. Uh, his early collections were somewhat traditional in approach, being exemplified by four-syllable metered verse, uh, but steadily became more influenced, he became more influenced by modernism. Nowadays, uh, Ko Kinao A is regarded as Sorry, he's, be, uh, he's regarded as one of the key postmodern and pioneering poets uh, to emerge from Kitsan era, era of Burmese poetry. Uh, however, he stresses that his writing style uh, emerged from close readings of old Burmese masters, such as de Gontea, and in the 1980s through the workshops of Mount Thano, another poet who I believe is also included in this collection. Uh, Ko Kin Ao A's latest collection, 54 Sentences, dictated by free thought, was published in 2011. Kin Ao A lives in Bangkok, but is known, well known outside of Southeast Asia from readings he has had in England, in Germany, in Finland, and at literary festivals in South Korea. To the left of Ko Kin Ao A is our brilliant <laughs> friend, Tim Hardy, who has agreed to help with interpretation uh, this afternoon. Can we just have a round of applause for us? All right, so how do you start a, a poetry, a talk about poetry? You start with poetry. So uh, our colleagues here, our friends, uh, Kose Alin would like to start by reading two of his poems for us. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much for, for having me here. This is my first time in New York and uh, first time um, reading poetry in New York. It's uh, <laughs> I got butterflies in my stomach. <laughs> well, the first, the first poem I'm going to read is um, in English. It's called um, My History Is Not Mine. Um, that was written back in 2005 when we were under this uh, heavy censorship and um, and the word history itself is very much loaded in our country because it carries um, um, meanings of um, ideology and uh, it's also a subversive word in the sense that um, this word history is, um, the, the government wants to use this word history as with their own meaning, like um, that they are making history for the people, for the, the, the citizens, for the masses. They are the leaders of history, and the people are the followers. But as for us, we want to take back that word history for ourselves, because we believe that it is the people who make history. So uh, the title is, My History Is Not Mine. I'd like to read that in Burmese. Not the mine, huh? not the mine, Mahopu. Not the Biloda, Dago, Namakwe Mahuet, Pio Yere. Not the mine go Yigera, Namahopu. Luce Yama, set a yak, Nago Matibu. To do Yigere, not the mine go, to do Matibu. A Mataya, young Sazia, Nama, Bamam Shibu. Jump you Zuzia, Matantinzia, to do Yige Jamaba. Dabime Namama Mibu Chow Sada Mishibu Ogu Mishibu Ayo Mishibu Pia Tau Mishibu Nada Mangu Na Jigera Mahopu Duro Yigera Duro Yinya Shindwi Duro Yigera Duro Amande Adwi Duro Yigera Shui Monche Danda Yidwi Eddie Tema Nabena Sa Paketale not the dream, not the gabu. Not the jingle, to do be ye get it. The jing, a changing jama. Naha, a mima polo do the jing lo. Don't keep that the jing lo. The jing down, my simang gayabu. The jing male, naha, nene kayabiande. Nama, piazia, sa yesa at a tow tardy. To do, pibi sozo, my ye gayabu. The Jema, 
ตุรุเบยีจาเรงัตติจิงโกตุรุเบยีจาเรงัตติจิงโกตุรุลีเดยีจาเรยีจาเรยีจาเรยีจาเรงาเปียนพะยาเรตะหะงัตตะมายเม
This, he says, is his hobby that doesn't harm anyone. So, am I an imbecile? Am I an idiot? The scheme has been so thorough. Now that we are far away from the feeder, let's go back to the filth. A harrowing ghost in the skin where I live. The grand music I have carried has been dropped and cracked. Someone has forgotten to say something. So they say, a number of stitches. So they say, I no longer know myself. What a genuine idiot, imbecile, nincompoop I am. Nope. That's not true. I don't know who's been putting these speeches in my mouth. You idiot. You who will marry your own corpse. Thank you so much, Kozerl. And now, Kokin Aue will, uh, would like to read for us uh, two poems of his. Thank you very much for coming. Biogwe Minu Miuri Alung Tuk Tretal Naso Tene Danebe Hoga Chang Kong Kong Ma Tabu Shadalu, Dan Shadalu, Pu Maki San Bier Danya no Jabima Nyaguinare Kabiade Boy Linga Nita Galasiga, so you get me. กุมาอาลุงหาชิลาเกวีตะชินสุเยเรปันมวยเมียอนามะยูเรตะกองยันคองลองเมียไอ้แม่แม่อ่ะมาจอกเตจวยยายเมียตะลุ่นๆคันซ
These are just portrayals on milestones we have passed and ashes in our clenched fists. As for me, the one who's using talcum powder, the one who's using perfumed soap. Ahead of us, doors opening, one after another, and an obsequious dog who knows his master's desires exactly. The dark cloud sinning to the end of the samsara. I had to swallow a drop of arak. Then, after a lot of thens, I was sold by my own street smartness. All I get in return are gilded footsteps, futures fashioned by a stray. Listen, as if just waking up, the mouth that's about to turn on me, nitpicking, like picking mushrooms and bamboo shoots, the look that's about to bury me alive, and with them, a pair of hypocritical hands. Between the two of us, there was never a misunderstood chat. Now you want to murder me? What day was it yesterday? As our child jingles at home, I am still drowning outdoors in the mire of lies. Poisonous liquid, daily vitter, existentialism, whatever. With such perfect pitch, who are you to resist before everything is squandered? At a snap of my fingers, all the social affairs are executed. All of a sudden, in this lovelorn evening, with suicide in the air, I, quit, I kiss the twilight. I sing a song of agony. Thank you. Uh, my second poem. มันเนปันตั้วปองมุกตุมุกกิมุกตะคุกุอตั้วพะยาตะคินมาอปูปิ้นชิ <laughs> ဖျားတခင်မဲဆိုတော့ပေါင်းပုံကိမ့်မှုကိစ္စကလေရှိနေလေးဆိုတော့ကပြောလိုက်မယ်ကြံကမှခုအပြောကိုကိုအနှုတ
God is not dead, can't speak well, can't hear well, even from those closest to him, but then God is God, and so the question of bread or cake still arises. Just as one is thinking of making oneself happy, makes one's happiness a delicate demand. Silk, satin, velvet, floral arabesques. Chief queens, one at the northern palace, one at the southern palace, with a bevy of personal attendants. Own dynasty, own mind, own reign, own kingdom, own palace. Correct any orthographical mistakes, that is your job. Do I have to read you the Das Kapital? The source of Das Kapital, Karl Marx, Engels. Bond before the weather report can be verified by the weather satellite. Like this, you son of a nymphomaniac. Abusive language, forget it, let it be. Do you have a fever now? Are you coughing now? Do you still feel a dull pain in the chest when you breathe deeply? Can you still broadcast, although disgruntled, that you die for your beloved country? If so, what will God say? Has God gone dumb having lost at dice? If you're not a lazy bum, go pile some cow dung at the foot of that tree. Go pick and have ready the microbalanced fruit for King Ashoka to chew moments before he expires. And if you're still unsatisfied, go dig a tunnel connecting the east and the west. And if you don't know how to do it, if you find it difficult to do it, go and consult the thing called Das Kapital. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Um, so we're going to just have a little conversation, and then we'll open it up to questions from the audience um, a little bit later. So you know, I was looking uh, at this anthology because I've had it for a couple of days now, and I'm just fascinated. I think what was um, what was uh, exhibited in the two poems we heard here is this incredible wit and sense of humor and, and, and wordplay. And I'm curious, like, I, I mean, I, I think a lot of people are just unaware. I mean, what's so fantastic about this anthology, a lot of people are unaware of this vibrant literary scene in Burma um, that, that it, you know, is, is, is constantly sharing as community, but is also just challenging itself. Um, and I'm wondering if you could speak to um, James, I mean, how the anthology came about, how the idea for the anthology came about, and then how gentlemen, uh, Kose Allen and, and Koken uh, Ale, how you came to be a part, become a part of it. Uh, well, to answer the question directed to me very briefly, because I could um, answer that for a long time, but it came about by a mistake. Uh, I was looking at um, Pakistani poetry and uh, for a magazine that I edit, wasn't possible to publish a feature on Pakistani poetry, so we looked at Burmese poetry, and we had to look very hard because I was working in the British Library trying to call up these anthologies that didn't exist. So um, I suddenly realized that there were, having seen uh, at least a dozen poems that I particularly liked, and as you're talking about the vibrancy and the playfulness and the wit uh, that I'd already seen on view, I wanted to see more of that, you know, more, more of what, what um, kind of different voices I could try and collect together for a project. And um, it really wasn't until I was in New York City working with Coco Thet that things started to take, uh, really take off in 2009. But it's taken six years, so that all seems like a long time ago. Six years, wow, that's amazing. And Kose Allen, I mean, uh, you, you certainly are the, one of the grand uncles of modernism, modernist poetry in, in Burma. Uh, the inclusion of your work in this, in this anthology is, is, um, is certainly apt. There, were hun there are hundreds of notable poets uh, across, across the country. Uh, how, I know you had a hand in helping translate some of this poetry. How, how has it been working on this project? Well, I think, um, if I remember correctly, it was like um, two years ago when I received an email from James um, asking me whether I would be interested in collaborating in having this um, anthology. And um, at first I wasn't quite sure what he was talking about because I, I, didn't, I couldn't you know, um, accept the idea that, that the world would want to read Burmese poems. So, um, 
I was reluctant at first, and you know, um, there wasn't this this um, um, this back and forth uh, communication between James and myself at, at that time. And then um, I received another me a message from Kuku there, and he said, um, "Yes, it's really going to, to happen." And um, so the next question was, "Okay, if it's going to happen, who's going to do it, and um, who will be?" represented in this anthology. And so Kuhude said, they're still working on it, and he wanted my advice. So um, I gave him a few names, not all of, the, all of them from this uh, book, because I didn't want to uh, look like you know, I was monopolizing this uh, poetry scene in the world, and I was like, um, just giving uh, James and Kuhude a list of poets. And I didn't want to leave out other poets too. So I uh, spread the news to uh, the other poets I knew, and I asked them to, you know, spread it further so that um, they could get um, poems from them. And then, um, at first I sent uh, James and Kuthe some of the poems, but later um, I told those poets to, you know, I gave them Kuthe and James's um, email, and I said, you do it on your own. So, um, um, up to now, even as I speak, some of the poets who were not included in this anthology are not happy about it. Yeah. <laughs> well, but then, you know, anthology is always, you know, it's a matter of who you include and who you exclude. So, um, um, so I'm happy that uh, I was um, selected in this, in this uh, anthology. And, you know, other people involved in making this anthology come true include Vicky Bowman, who was um, the ex-ambassador of the British Embassy. And so Vicky knew a lot of poets, and um, um, this Sia Mangano, who is a well-known, very much respected critic, translator, uh, linguist, um, met Vicky, and the two of them sort of uh, helped to choose which poets to include. So I think um, um, I'm lucky to be included in this, in this anthology. And um, 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 although I feel that some of the better poets have been left out, but then uh, what can I do? Because the editors have to choose. But anyway, I thank um, <laughs> Bo James and Kogute for having this, uh, making this, this idea come true. Thank you. We will, we will we'll make sure that we put those other poets in the sequel. Please do. This is, this is hopefully the first of many anthologies. Can I just add some very small caveat to that? I mean, uh, just to give you a rough sense of Burmese poetry, it goes back at least 10 centuries. So the decision whether to put uh, together a book of modern Burmese poetry or to think of Kitsan, which is testing the times, uh, which really started in the 1930s, uh, and was very formal in its structure and yet progressive at the same time, or whether to look at what's called kitpo, modern poetry, less than uh, the poets, uh, the ilk of Zayalin, who are much more interested in, uh, uh, well, influenced by translation of poets like Charles Bernstein and John Ashbery, who are poets that are big in Burma uh, because of Zayalin, ostensibly. So, so many poets to choose from. I'm not trying to, uh, you know, absolve myself here, but so many poets to choose from, and, um, and so many strands of poetry to look at. So that, that's just the, what I was going to add, sorry. No, that's great. And, and Ko, can I, uh, you're, 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 you're in this, we should mention too, there are 15 poets in this anthology. Um, I believe uh, four women as well included in the anthology. S three women. Uh, so it's it's uh, it's it's quite a, a significant number of of po po poets, and I think they each have four or five po poems each in the anthology. So um, it, it's a it's it's a good buy. Um, but Ken Al, hey, can you tell us? I mean, you, you've been on the poetry scene in Burma for, I mean, many years, and and now you you live abroad. Uh, you live in Thailand now. But can you talk about? Um, the significance of, of an anthology like this, uh, two Burmese poets, uh, now it's, 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 it's being released in, in, in the West for English language readers to, to see both the Burmese and the English 
together, side by side, on the same, on the same page. Could you talk about what that, what that means to, to the po poetry community? In Burma? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, first of all, the words very simple is uh, uh, very happy because uh, we are, our lives are close in our country, as the world know. We have uh, never expressed our feeling or our thoughts or so it's very all my life, at least uh, 50 years are uh, gap with the international things are uh, except the in entertainment in literature and especially poetry is a uh, very difficult for us to keep in touch with the internationally. One is uh, our, most of the, our Burmese poets are not very good in English. And then books and uh, uh, the things are very lack for us. Only we uh, depend on the translation, uh, uh, the international works translated already into Burmese. We have depend on that much. So we are not very, we mean uh, I am very confident much to, uh, even though before this book has come out, oh, our poems are really uh, good for the internationally how, I, I, I really worry for that. Even though I'm satisfied myself in our, uh, my own language and my, in my country, oh, I'm poets, I can proud myself, but for internationally really worry. But after this book has come out, um, my experience, I have uh, several uh, reading in uh, Europe, like London, Berlin, and somewhere, really good response. So this book is very important for us to, the, like a key to open the, the door for the people who come out, uh, come in and we come out, so connection. This is very important. That's great. I'm thinking um, a lot about, I like, love that you mentioned keys and sort of opening doors, and we know that now Burma appears to be opening up um, the last few years. And um, James mentioned um, the great influence uh, of the translations that Jose Arlen has made of New York School poets, Frank O'Hara, John Ashbery, um, other poets like Charles. Charles Bernstein, um, and I'm wondering if you could talk about sort of, so you sort of opened the door already for, for a modernism, for postmodernism, postmodernist poetry to flourish across the country. And now that sort of, it seems the door politically is open, widening a little bit more. Do you think that it's going to, now we're just gonna see an explosion, a renaissance of poetry, or, or what are you saying? Because you just, you just came here from Rangoon three days ago. Yeah. Um, translation has been, like Koi Kiyang said just now, translation has been very influential in, I would, I would even say the driving force of um, Myanmar poetry. Um, the Kisan movement that started in the 30s, uh, led by Sia Mintu and, and Sia Zoji, this mm. Kisa movement, which was experimental poetry at that time, it came about because these two leading poets were um, studying in Cambridge University. So they brought back those Western ideas back to Burma, and um, they started this, this Kisa movement, which, which in Burmese it uh, translates into testing the times, um, somewhat experimental. Uh, what they did was to break away from about uh, 10 centuries of Burmese classical poetry. So that was the, the, the first movement that came about due to um, translation and having um, um, been into the Western world of poetry. Then um, the second movement, which started in the 50s, that was called uh, New Writing, Sabete New Writing, and that movement was very much influenced by um, Marxism, by Marxist ideology. And again, that Marxist ideology came into Burma through translations. So, and the third one was the, the modern movement that was during the 70s. And that, that modern poetry movement started with uh, this translation of Mount Thano's poems called um, In the Shade of the Pine Tree. And that, that collection 
included American, British, French, Spanish, Russian, modern writers, modern poets. So that was an eye-opener for a lot of Burmese poets at that time. Because, you see, they, like, uh, as Goh Kyung Ho said just now, you know, we have always been isolated from the world, and um, that collection of modern poets um, made poets, uh, our local poets, think about poetry apart from what they've been doing for, for centuries. And Mount Dano also said a very famous uh, sentence. He said, even if Burmese poets wanted to have a sniff of modern poetry, there's no such thing. So he took it on himself to translate those modern poets and into Burmese and published it. And that was in 1968. And um, a few years later, this modern, Burmese modern poetry appeared. And the most significant characteristic of modern Burmese poetry is lack of rhyme. It was totally rhymeless. It was uh, verse libra, free verse. And a lot of, a lot of uh, the Burmese poets at that time, established Burmese poets, were against this because they said, how can it be poetry if there's no rhyme? <laughs> See, so, but then it caught on and um, um, what the modern poets did, the leading modern poets, I would say Ko Aung Cheng, who's in the, uh, this, this anthology, uh, Mang Chon Nui, uh, Tuke Mei Lai, Po Wei, what they did was, you know, they learned a lot from um, Sia Mang Tano's um, translation that poetry can be built on imagery and colloquial speech and rhythm rather than on rhyme. So that was a totally uh, avant-garde movement at that time. And um, 20 years later, 1990s, um, I first discovered post-Soviet Russian poetry. And you know, at that time, uh, modern, Burmese modern poetry was like 20 years old, and it was starting to you know, become silted, and people were writing in the same model, the same form, because they did not have any exposure to alternative poetry. So a lot of um, poets were asking, is this poetry, is that all we can do? They wanted something new. And then at that time, this idea of postmodernism in literature was appearing, and Sia Zozo Ao was um, translating a lot of um, um, theories by uh, Derrida, by Foucault, and um, poets were interested. And then they started asking, okay, now we know something about what postmodernism means, what poststructuralism means, but where is postmodern poetry? So there was this, this uh, hunger for postmodern poetry. And um, so what I did was, okay, I can help you, I can translate postmodern poetry into Burmese. So the first, uh, the first one that I did was post-Soviet Russian poetry. And um, a lot of those uh, Russian poets at that time, when they were interviewed, they would always say that they were influenced by American language poetry. And at that time, I didn't know what it was. So that was uh, uh, the, the, the first thing that I translated. And then uh, I translated um, New York poetry, John Ashbery, uh, Frank O'Hara, Barbara Guest. Then the third thing I translated was um, Sylvia Plath, because I wanted well, Burmese women poets to know something about um, this confessional poem, a confessional poetry. And you know, at that time, um, only three Burmese poets came to attend this, this uh, book launch. And, and you know, I distinctly remember one Burmese poet, a woman poet, who had recently got married, and she said, why bring in this kind of poetry into our, our country? Because it's against our culture. We have this saying in Burmese, the son is the master and the husband is your god. So there was this, you know, a lot of male domination in, in Burma at that time, and they just couldn't accept um, uh, Sylvia Platz, you know, going against that male domination and you know, coming up with uh, feminist ideas. But now, nowadays, um, younger women poets in their 20s, they are going back to my translation of Sylvia Platt. And you know, they, are, they are like 
um, they have rediscovered Sylvia Platt. And um, the next one I translated was, uh, of course, language poetry, language writing. Um, and um, first, I translated the, the um, theoretical background, I would say, of language poetry, how um, um, language is being seen in a new way in its uh, materiality and um, how language is not just a medium of uh, communication or medium of expression, but how language itself constructs what you want to express. So um, at that time, I received a lot of flack from modernist, modern poets who said, what are you talking about? We are already writing poetry in language. What do we have to know about language? <laughs> so, you know, so, um, 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 I, I gave them the same example that Bob Perriman gave, you know, like um, this, this um, um, referentiality that, that you, they think this word refers to something out in the world. And so there's this correspondence. But what they don't know is that um, this word can have several meanings according to readers, and then uh, the poet can never expect to expect that his or her reader would read his or her poem in the same way that he wrote it or she wrote it. Then um, I also came up with, uh, um, after reading a lot about uh, constructivism, I learned that you know how language constructs social reality. So combining that, um, this language poetry and constructivism, um, I introduced not language poetry or writing per se, but language oriented. Because I was also reading um, the Cambridge poetry of uh, Jeremy Prynne at that time. So, um, and then the, the problem that I had was lack of materials. That was in like uh, 1998, 2000, and we had no access to the internet, uh, no access to, to books. Um, I had to rely a lot on the database of um, Yangon University and nobody was interested in that. But I found that there was something here in, in language poetry that can um, push our Burmese poetry you know, to a wider space. So, um, so I did that, and I've been, up to now, a lot of people know Zia Lin as ha, LP, language poetry, language poet, which I always say I'm not a language poet. <laughs> I introduce the ideas of language poetry, language writing, but I myself, I'm not a language poet. But, um, so to uh, put it in a nutshell, uh, our country's poetry has always been um, pushed ahead by translations. And currently, what we call contemporary poetry, which is the kind of poetry that is neither traditional poetry nor modern poetry. This, um, a new kind of poetry, con we call it contemporary poetry, um, will not have appeared without this translation of language poetry. So um, um, in a way, contemporary Myanmar poetry owes a lot to Charles Bernstein, Bob Perelman, Ron Silliman, uh, Lynn Hedgian, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, could you, you know, you mentioned a couple of times, uh, Kose Alain, about isolation and um, uh, about lack of resources and, and access to, to the internet and, and to um, modern uh, texts. And I'm wondering if you and um, Koken Ao A could speak to, I mean, you know, a lot of this, because of the, um, disintegration by the military of formal education, so almost all of this happens informally. It happens in tea shops, through conversations, it happens in community spaces. I know that you were just at a friend of, mutual friend of ours, um, Marat Luntuan has the 7,000 Baduk space that is, uh, that's hosting poets to do readings, which happens a lot in, in private. Can you talk about this um, and how this has been important and significant to the development of a lot of these uh, young poets uh, in, in, included in this anthology and certainly to, to your work as well, I would imagine. Um, yeah. There are 
two kinds of poetry in Myanmar. The first kind is the government approved, government sanctioned poetry, and the other one is the kind of poetry that is frowned on by the government because um, they don't follow the government policy. And, uh, and uh, we consider that the second kind of poetry is the real poetry, which, you know, doesn't, um, um, which is not supported by the government and which does not support the government. So the second kind of poetry is um, like um, um, poetry of dissent. And um, for that, we don't have any academic institution that supports us. The government poetry is, of course, it is uh, um, transmitted through uh, schools, through the academic institution, but um, um, students just learn those poems in the textbooks, in the curricula, just to pass the exam. But they will be reading the poems in magazines, the poems that are written uh, by real poets. They would be reading those poems, and they would say, you know, there's such a big difference, because um, why is, why is the, the, the Ministry of Education teaching us these old, old, old poems when the real poetry is out there? So in a sense, um, um, we are not supported by the government. And you know, every year there is this um, national poetry competition, and there's one clause which says, no modern poetry allowed. <laughs> up to now, up to now, you see. So our kind of uh, poetry, modern poetry, postmodern poetry, are considered, you know, um, outlaw poetry by the government, and we love it because we'd rather be outlaw than be <laughs> government-sanctioned poetry. Yeah. So um, um, the way we disseminate our ideas is, of course, through, um, um, like what Philip said, in tea shops, uh, in the liquor shops, and then uh, in small circles in private. We have our private readings. You know, we invite um, any poet who wants to come. Yeah. Then we do our readings, then we discuss. So um, um, this modern poetry and postmodern poetry has happened because of these small private circles of poets meeting each other and, and sharing ideas. Yeah. So what Zianin said, uh, uh, the few places we are uh, discussing and uh, are working mostly is in a liquor shop. <laughs> <laughs> so that's true. Yeah. Same I mean, in America, same. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm happy in USA now. <laughs> so uh, I remember that uh, in our time, we are struggling for our, at the time, new poetry. Modernist poetry is a very new poetry. We have the revolt. We have a uh, peoples against, the senior peoples are not like our poems. Oh, what are you? You are stubborn or something like that. We have to face the, these things. But we are uh, talking like tea shop and liquor shop and we try. First, I remember in our country, first like a uh, workshop is Zialin. He presented, uh, I think, 2002, and in the uh, first time in his school invited to us, we just gather and drink something, he said. So uh, he invited, at the time, uh, me and my age and a little bit five years, 10 years younger poets, together about 20s. Nowadays, some are very key poets nowadays. So at the, the first time, I can see it looked like a workshop we are starting, about 2002, I think. So later, we have some, uh, more uh, other workshop, but less than your, your school. I think every year he, he present, uh, every year invite to, to, to discuss about the, the poetry and how we're going there. And then another one is a very famous and important poet, Mang Chuan Wei, who passed away in 2002. So the words he declared at the first workshop, he said, Mang Chuan is dead, and modern poetry is dead. He declared. So we shock at the time because we love very much modernist poetry. At the time, the most important and the, the 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 huge and very big for us, all all my poet's life until at that years Mang Chuan is passed away. Then he declared that, and then we starting uh, the the postmodern let's say postmodern language poetry or every non-modern poetry are 
introduce us. And then younger poets are better than us to learn very quick because they are young and they are very active. Every, so young poets nowadays, uh, we expect in young poets come out more variety and more fresh poems will come up. My point would be that. I uh, just add something very small onto that. Um, and it really goes back to your previous question, Phil, about the doors are open. Uh, um, and of course, I, I've only been to Burma a few times, so I'm really a tourist talking about this. But, um, you know, when, when my uh, prime minister in England, David Cameron, shows up with uh, shopping bags which are full of democracy, then we shouldn't, be, we shouldn't be fooled by this at all. Because, of course, at the same time, whilst you know, economic um, changes are you know, really important, also uh, Burma seems to me very desperately in need of educational reform. And what I'm talking about here, if we just marry this with translation, Zia Lin has talked about the own, uh, his own work and that of, say, Amang Thano. And there are a few others, but there's no real support from um, the government, and perhaps nor should there be, but there's no, there's no chance really of surviving as a translator purely or, 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 or having, say, a translation department in the university or even actually getting a degree in English literature in Burma. You get a degree in Burmese literature, but not in English literature. Nothing like creative writing, translation workshops. Now, I'm not necessarily advocating that that is the way to change things, but certainly with such an exciting, they call themselves post-88 generation emerging, and there's a lot of very fine young poets that I've happened to read. Well, I wonder who will be their, their translators of their generation. Uh, so that's, that's all I was gonna add. Uh, can I add something here, please? Um, just now when uh, Philip said, uh, mentioned this, um, this fact that Burma has opened up. Um, that is now being reflected in the diversity of um, poems that we are witnessing today in, in our country. Um, there are people who, poets, young poets, who call themselves um, language-oriented, um, and um, some who call themselves conceptualists, because um, a, a poet called Nye Wei has translated a lot of uh, Kenny Goldsmith's work in Burmese. So um, uh, younger poets are aware of conceptual poetry. Um, there are some who call themselves neo-modernists, um, digital poets, um, and um, um, some who don't want to be categorized or labeled as you know, language poet or whatever. They, they would prefer to call themselves hybrid. Yeah, they would be uh, more eclectic in the sense that you know, they would just pick and choose the um, the techniques that they like. But I think, uh, no, not, not that I think, I believe that this um, introduction of um, language poetry, language writing to the Burmese poetry scene opened up a lot of doors. And now we are seeing, especially younger people, you know, they are now in touch with, uh, they have access to the internet, and those who have good English, they are in touch with uh, people like um, um, Nada Gordon and um, um, like Kenny Goldsmith, uh, Catherine uh, Bugwall. So um, they are now um, getting those fresh ideas and they want to, to, to write new poems with their new ideas. So I think in the coming five years or 10 years, we're gonna see like this, what Philip said, this explosion of um, Burmese poetry that might include some writing that may not even be considered poetry at all. Because actually, uh, two years back, a young poet called Lunset Nomia, he's in his, um, that, at that time was his, about 28, he uh, launched his book, he published his book, but the title of that book was Writings. He did not want to use the word poetry at all. Because um, uh, what he said was, he knows that the established poets, especially the older generation, would not accept his writings as poems, as poetry. So he said, okay, doesn't matter. If you don't want to call my, my work poetry, I'm gonna call it writings. So that is a new trend now. You know, moving away from this 
preconceived notions and established notions of poetry into new fields, and they are happy with the term writings. Uh, we want to get in some audience questions, but before we do, I'd like to hear, if it's possible, can we hear some more poetry before we do that? You want to share with us? Should we switch it around and uh, can I read yeah, the first poem? Yeah. Okay. Uh, we'd like to read a poem uh, by uh, one of the younger poets in the anthology called Pandora. Um, so we're going to read, um, let me just find it for you. Of course, you can look through for biographical information when you buy the book. Um, when, right? <laughs> uh, I, you'll be familiar with the term daft, as in it's more polite than stupid, I suppose. Shall I read it? Um, you want to read it in Burmese first? Yeah, first okay. Lubemia Mugu, think by saying Lubainuya, Yijia Menuya, Lele, Twalari Maharanigu, Kuka Petade, Trojan Mio Jiga, Wanda Aya, Mureu, Mount Winlari, Yoma Yagdo, Niwa Miane, Nijimbi, Mio Debu. ยอมาลูจิ้นยาเลยจงยาเลยลูเบ้งด้วยหาซีซ่าเอ็นหนอกจ้องหูด้านเนี่ยทุเรอันทุนนี้ก็มิงกุนเลยเปียวยอปุต
The daft virus is airborne. The daft sim symptoms are feverish and words flowing out of the nine holes of the body. In 24 hours, the patient becomes absolutely daft. The daft spit at the non-daft. They lick them with their tongues. They bite them with their teeth. As the daft population grows, the non-daft have, have to pretend to be daft. The way the daft look, the way the daft walk, the way the daft dress, the way the daft work, the way the daft eat and sleep, the way the daft type, the daft fashion, the daft and non-daft are no longer distinguishable. On the back of the horse Kanaka, the prince Sadata followed the ascetic, ascetic path to shun the daft. He came back after the great awakening. He confronted the daft as the Buddha, the emaciated, for the daft thinking daft, the Dharma preachers, have to downgrade their Dharma versions. The preachers die preaching. The daft have crucified Jesus Christ. The daft have assassinated Lady Diana. They have flattened the jungles in search of Marilyn Monroe and Michael Jackson. They have snapped Tiger Woods' wood. They have scrambled for <laughs> Socrates' poison cup. In, unanim in unanimity, the daft have decided to pronounce inanity inanition. They have decided to make do with cakes whenever bread is not available. They have driven a man, his son, and their mule out of the village. They have moved the Statue of Liberty to Baghdad. They have ordered an atom bomb from Einstein. They have made a knife bar mark on the rib of a boat. As the daft from all corners of the planet are enjoying themselves in their merry-go-rounds, boom, the sky is collapsing. The deafening noise, the daft in uproar, the daft in commotion, the daft in chaos, the daft stampeding. Um, the poem I'm going to read is uh, it's titled Big Sister Lisa, Have You Been to Liza? Um, I think um, uh, it would be um, good to give you some background of this poetry, of this poem. Um, since the ex-military regime has um, uh, given up power and set up their civilian government, um, there have been a resurgence of civil war in our country up to now. Um, the ethnic races, at one time, you know, they were um, uh, almost annihilated by the, by, the, by the military, by the Burmese military. And uh, these, these uh, ethnic races have now started up their own uh, armies. So um, now we are witnessing this uh, civil war between the, the government and uh, the Kachin, one of the ethnic races in our country, the Kachin people. And Liza is the headquarters of this Kachin Independence Army. Um, about 20 years ago, there was another very, very strong um, ethnic group called the Karens, but they lost their headquarters called Manapalo in 1990. And right now, um, some Shan national groups are also starting up this, um, um, their bid for independence with their own army. So it's ironic that, you know, when it, when during this time when the country should be moving ahead towards democratization, there is civil war going on. So that's one thing in um, what's happening right now. And how it reflects our poetry is, um, you know, um, one strand that has appeared in our uh, world of poetry is uh, what we call the documentary kind of writing. Because at one time, um, poets were not allowed to write anything directly. So what they had to do was, especially the modernist poets, what they had to do was they had to internalize things that were happening in the country and write as if they were writing their own personal expressions, personal emotions, personal feelings. But now, people are uh, writing things directly. Now, for example, there is this, um, 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 in Upper Myanmar, there is this copper mine, which is owned by the Chinese government. And 
And before this new civilian government appeared, we did not know that the ex-military government had sold it to the Chinese government. And that's just one thing. Now, we, a lot of that um, um, selling away our land, our, our resources, are coming out slowly. And so um, some poets are writing about these very, very directly. And um, another strand is what we call prison poetry. The inmates, the prisoners uh, of, uh, who were imprisoned by the ex-military government are now, they've been set free, and then now they are publishing the poems that they wrote in prison. And so um, on the one hand, we are noticing a very um, politicized form of poetry that is appearing. And um, some people fear that, you know, that the, the aesthetic part of poetry would, be, would disappear, especially you know, during the modern period, modern poetry period, when we were not allowed to say anything, write anything about politics. Even the, the, the use of the word politics in a coffee shop can send you to prison for 20 years. So now, uh, people are, and, and then uh, we don't have this censorship anymore, which was uh, abolished last year. So in this, in this um, environment or atmosphere of freedom, people are writing very directly about politics. And so going back to um, this fear of poetry losing its, its poeticness or poeticality or the aesthetic aspect, um, people like me, what we want to do is we want to combine. We don't want to be just writing political poetry because when the subject matter becomes too dominant, you know, it doesn't sound like poetry anymore. It's not. It's, it becomes like um, you know, like a a news report in chopped up prose and chopped up lines. So we want to combine this political aspect and still keep up, keep it as, make it as a, a poem. Construct, still constructed as a poem. So in this uh, poem, I have uh, spliced a very well-known song of the 80s uh, sung by this Korean national singer, Noliza. And um, um, that song in the 80s was a hit. The name of the song was Dynamite. So um, I spliced that uh, words, lyrics from that, that song with the events happening in um, Liza, the uh, headquarters of the Kitchen Independence Army, and Manapalo, uh, which fell to the, to the government in the 90s. And it has a very sort of um, a slant towards um, um, the plight of the national races in our country, who are still um, very, very uh, undeveloped. And you know, one reason we called this book Burmese Contemporary Poetry rather than Myanmar is that um, there, is, there has been, up to now, this Burmanization of the country. The government has said that there are 135 national races in Myanmar, but these races cannot use their own language. They have to use Burmese. So there's this linguistic domination as well. Big Sister Lisa, have you been in Lisa? <clears throat> Big Sister Lisa, you are such a dynamite. I've been smitten since I was a child, a child soldier in the Karen army. Guitar music that exploded like shells, sleepless nights in Manapalo before Manapalo fell. Christ on the cross shot down by a rocket launcher Dynamite, what a delight to love our ethnic races. Dynamite, <laughs> refugees lining up on the roadside are not for sale, not for export. We love our big brothers too, those fighter pilots that strafe us from the sky. Big sister Lisa, with two six shooters on your belt sings, bang, bang, just like a cowboy, I will shoot you down, my love. Riddled with bullets, your lovers, including me. Since we can't have peace, give us at least a fly-proof outhouse. 
Big Sister Lisa, my sex symbol, dynamite. Once at Piwa restaurant, Big Sister Lisa crooned, Sherry, pointing your index finger at me. Those guys gave me a slant when they ravished you with violence, seduction, money, power, gifts, and exchanges. I exploded. Dynamite! I will shoot you down, my love. Heavy artillery, warplanes, choppers, columns. Lychee from Liza goes into neighboring country for safe command of headquarters. In the jade mines of Pakan, one just has to dig another hole. If one doesn't hit it rich with the first, there is always another. The death pit is nothing exotic. It is not important. Dynamite! In front of Mala Hall on Prome Road. Dynamite! Big Sister Lisa. I've laid down my arms and returned to legal fold. In this new life, I see protesting limbs everywhere. I have entertained on stage for the sake of peace, unity, and harmony, as well as backstage for interracial understanding. Dynamite! Ethnic racists by the roadside line up for slavery abroad. I work as a cleaner at Pinlong Hospital. I have swapped my gun for a broom. Dynamite! Big Sister Lisa. If you sleep with every commander on their negotiation table, will our union climax? Dynamite! Dynamite in bed, not foreign made. Ethnic races are low cost, cheap. Is that it? For the wealth of the whole nation, let's all commit suicide. Dynamite! Bang, bang, just like a cowboy. Heavy artillery will annihilate us out of compassion. Big Sister Lisa, Here's the bullet I extract from my heart. It's just soft core dynamite. It used to go, die, 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 dynamite, dynamite. Thank you so much. We have about 10 minutes left, so hopefully if you, hopefully we can get in at least two questions. Uh, from the audience, so who has a question? We have a microphone going around too, so please, please speak into the microphone. Hi, uh, this was wonderful panel, thank you very much. I haven't yet bought the anthology, don't worry, we'll buy several. Um, so I don't know who else is in there, uh, are there, so, are there any ethnic poets in there, or are there any prominent uh, Shan, Karen, Chin? I'm afraid there aren't any. Dynamite. That's why, that's why we call it <laughs> Burmese. Yeah. Most of the poets, all of the poets, are born after the Second World War. The youngest poet is. Um, Mong Yupai, who was born in 1981, so it's quite a, a lot of time. Uh, yeah, I'd like to add to this um, question of um, the inclusion or the exclusion of um, national race poets. You know, even in our country, in the um, magazines, we only have Burmese poets writing in Burmese. We do not have these um, um, poets of national races, ethnic races, writing in Burmese in the, in the magazines. Maybe it's because um, um, they don't want to write in Burmese. They have their own um, underground Samizdat uh, ethnic magazines in which they write in their own language, see? But um, last year, one of the ethnic races called Chin, they, uh, the young poets brought out a book in Chin language. And they wanted me to translate that into Burmese, of, but I don't, I don't speak Chin at all. But what they wanted was, you know, um, they wanted a bilingual Chin version, original version, and the Burmese version. So when I asked them, why don't you write in Burmese from the beginning? And they said, they don't want to write in Burmese. They just want to write in their language. So this, the next question was, if so, why do you want me to translate it into Burmese? And they said, they want the Burmese reading public to, uh, to 
appreciate their poems. So um, um, I think in the coming few years, we're going to see more and more of um, um, poems written in these ethnic races. But then the problem is going to be, um, um, can they go beyond their, their uh, ethnic race and you know, get into the Burmese mainstream? Because um, um, about 85% of the population happen to be Burmese. So if they are not, if they are satisfied with, you know, just having their, um, um, their poems in their language, among their community, that's, that's okay with them, it's okay with us. But we also would like to know what they are writing, and they also would want to, uh, want us, the larger uh, Burmese population, to have an understanding of their poems. So I think one day, coming soon, there might be this translation into Burmese of poems written by these ethnic races, which we have yet to see. Just as an information, last, last year, uh, one of the Chin young ladies, Anna, Anna. Adi, uh, published a book. Uh, she also writing Chin language first, and then she uh, translated to Burmese, and then when, at the time, she had not idea uh, to Burmese version, she, she would like to publish only Chin. So why not? You, your, your translation is not very bad, so I will help you to edit something. So she encouraged and then she uh, translated in Burmese, so bilingual is published and I'm writing some preface for, for her. This one is a maybe first book in our country in Burmese language ethnics, maybe come out more, I, I hope so. Yeah, we too. Uh, one more question? We have four minutes. One more question we can probably take. Can I, can I ask a question? Nobody asking. I think we have some. Hi, yes. Um, um, do you think that the translation work that you did and um, obviously it influenced influenced a lot of Burmese younger generation. But do you think that the Burmese would benefit also um, by directly reading Western literature in English? Um, because I understand that the education system has been so completely messed up that the English language is not a very strong um, force in the education system there. Um, before, when, when my family left in 72, there was two kinds of education system where some people were, who can, who has the resources would put their children to like Catholic schools where um, all the subjects are taught in English. And then there's the public school which we also went. We, we went to both where all the subjects are taught in Burmese except English. So there is something like, I don't know, maybe something like 50 years of that bad education happening in that country. And, and of course, it's, it's a great thing that you did to introduce and to translate all that Western literature. But do you think that there's a hunger in the younger generation of poets and writers to actually read Western literature in, in the source language. I think that's a great question. We need to have the short answer because we're running out of time. I'll just give you a short answer of something I've seen. Uh, I thought you were making many interesting comments, but just about the last part. Uh, the uh, post-88 generation includes many writers who want to be read in Burmese and in English, um, uh, and some who are writing directly in English. Um, and even Coco Thet, who is in this book, my, my co-editor, who did a phenomenal job. We haven't talked about him today, but I'd like to just mention that what he did was extraordinary. Uh, he writes in English, and, and his poems were translated back into Burmese. But I, I, I suppose I was just going to say that what you do um, not to um, publish, uh, not to translate the book, or, uh, I mean, eventually, it will, the readership will evolve, you would imagine. So it's out there now. So. I think it's better that it is. Yeah. Yeah, can I add something a little bit? Um, 
Like you said, it's true that um, the education system has still now is really messed up, and this uh, teaching and learning of English is really terrible. Because up to now, uh, English hasn't been taught as a language for use, but it's just thought as a subject to pass exam. So the level of English of uh, the majority of people in our country is very, very low, terribly low. But um, um, poets, of course, do want to read in English. Uh, for one thing, there's this doubt you know, whether uh, the, the poems that I've translated are really original, you know, close to the original, or to how far it is from original. So they want to know the origin in, in English. So that's one thing. Another thing is um, the younger generation in their 20s, they know that, that you know, um, translators like Seau Utano and myself, we can do just so much. And they know that they're right, there is um, a, a whole world of poetry out there which we haven't even touched upon yet. So um, some of those poets who are uh, more proficient in English, they are you know, jumping into the internet and you know, they are just picking and choosing and things they like. So I think um, um, it all depends on you know, how, how strong your command of language is. Not only language, also how strong their passion for poetry is. So I think those two things have to combine because uh, it's not just simply a matter of language because um, if it were you know, a matter of language, all English speaking people would become automatically poets. But it doesn't happen. So I think it, is, it needs both. Yeah? Uh, we could go on and on. There are thousands of questions. I am really glad, talking about original language, I am really happy to have these two original poets who are included in this anthology here with us today, came all the way from Southeast Asia. And the theme of this year's um, Pin World Voices Festival is bravery. And I can't think of a more brave and an app, word, an app word to describe the work that the two of you do and that so many of these poets have done. And as James mentioned, we didn't talk a lot about Coco Thet, but there are many people who, need, who are acknowledged in the inside of this book, including Vicki Bowman and Christopher Merrill, who uh, runs the International Writing Program at Iowa University, who was very helpful um, in making this anthology happen. So thank you all so much for coming. These writers will be available outside. You can talk to them. Enjoy the rest of the video.